a great privilege for me to welcome all of you to this sanctuary, St. Mary, Mother of God, as the Metropolitan Washington community gathers in prayer, seeking God's compassion following the terrible Metro train tragedy. We also welcome all the Metro employees, the first responders, the leaders of the police and firefighters who have worked so valiantly this week. Well, I, I was just really proud to be in the same sanctuary with them and because this is what they do every day. And a lot of times it's not reported on the news, but uh, you know they're in the business of saving lives 24 seven. So it was really a privilege to sit you know, across the aisle from them. It's like any other day in the city. The rush hour is, is building by uh, 4.30. Uh, it's well on its way. Uh, general heavy traffic. The uh, metro system is, is at uh, high capacity and uh, taking people home from a hard day's work. Welcome, Robinson. 22, 14, 24, 11, and 17. Trucks 11 and 6, Battalion 4, Battalion Chief of Special Ops, Battalion 6, Rescue Squad 2, Ambulance 20, Medic 17, EMS 4, and the Safety Officer Respond. Fort Train Derailment at Tacoma Metro Station, 301 Cedar Street, Northwest. There has been a deadly commuter train collision in Northeast Washington, D.C. This is CNN Breaking News. Two D.C. Metro trains have collided within the past hour, this occurring during rush hour. This scene is really dramatic and it is frightening in many ways. We stopped and then uh, felt like an explosion. We were hit at it seemed like full speed by the train behind us. I realized this was going to be a major incident, or at least thought it would be, by the dispatch. Not often do you have the description that the train has been derailed, one train has struck another, and it's sitting atop of another train. So that was sort of the, the picture that was initially painted, and I knew almost instinctively it was time for me to start driving towards uh, the metro uh, station at Tacoma. Popped out of my car, I could see um, uh, probably 150 uh, people uh, wandering around the track bed. I was looking at our members uh, physically picking people up and carrying them out uh, in their hands. You see the train up in the air, it was, uh, I mean, it was kind of shocking. I, I never expected to see that. Yeah, a derailment, yeah, maybe expecting to see a train off the track or whatever, but to see a train up in the air like that, it was. It was, uh, it was a total shock. As we made, it, made our way down the track bed, um, there were people coming out, and it was, a, it was kind of a surreal almost, because there wasn't any, cr any screaming, there wasn't any crying, uh, there wasn't people running away, they were just kind of walking away from the incident. It really didn't take that long to get in service. Probably from the time we got there, arrived on the scene. I would say they were operating hydraulic tools within 10 to 15 minutes. And as we uh, got in, we started moving from uh, where the train was accessible, the only place it was accessible at that, at that point in time, um, up forward. And at that time, we just started uh, walking people out, putting them on the side. Anybody that was able to walk with us, tell them to walk up to the end of the fence so they can be better treated. There was about uh, at least a half a dozen, if not more, pretty seriously injured uh, patients laying on the ground, and they were right below the train. So the guys that were up on top of the train, they were, they were moving seats and throwing them over the side, so it was kind of precarious. Uh, we were up there for a good couple of hours working before it kind of became a recovery operation, and uh, it was oily. The car was tilted to its side a little bit. And I mean, nobody fell off. That was, that was quite amazing in itself. Got back on it, the train, um, just started going forward, climbing through doors, 
climbing over the benches, chairs, to help anybody that was coming out. Once I got there, it was a horrific scene. It was something that I was not expecting. When you have people that fear, when something happens and they fear of dying, and you have, am I going to die? What can you say to a person if they say, am, am I going to die? You, you just have to be there. That human side, not your professional side, it has to blend. Everybody just looked, as far as the patients were concerned, the victims, just in a state of shock. So my responsibility at that point was to talk to them, calm them down, try to ascertain what kind of injuries that they had. We saw a lady who had, um, her leg was partially amputated, her arm was partially amputated, and she had a hole in the left side of her chest. She had like um, tissue coming out of her chest. Engine nine's crew with, with uh, paramedic Williams at the lead went ahead, they, they banged her, they treated her, they gave her an IV, they spoke to her, and they kept her alive long enough while we were waiting for a transport to be arranged. I also had a young man at the age of about 15 who had a double femur fracture, and I put him in a, in a splinting device and stretched his leg out on the uh, hair traction splint. And, uh, to help relieve the pain. Then there was a 15-year-old girl who was sitting, um, like laying next to her, along with a guy that was laying next to her. And I was like, can you, can you get up? You know, she's like, no. And I said, well, why? What's hurt? She's like, she had debris. There was debris everywhere. And she's like, my leg is stuck in the fence. So we looked down, and uh, we, uh, we got bolt cutters. Um, somebody came over with bolt cutters after we realized her foot was like embedded into the fence. I've been to car accidents where people are trapped and it takes us a long time to get them out just because of the way they're trapped, but nothing, nothing this bad. Oh, I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, we practice for it, you drill for it, but nobody ever thinks that it's gonna happen. But, I mean, I, everything went according to like what we've practiced, like the incident command system, um, and everybody just kind of like fell into their job, which made it a little easier and, uh, like made it flow a little better. Patients were bored and collared. Um, injuries were dressed, vital signs were taken, and victims were quickly placed inside of units and on their way to the um, emergency rooms. Since 9-11, uh, this department has committed a tremendous amount of resources and time and energy on preparing for the big one, whatever the big one looks like. Looking at that, how much damage there was, and then again to realize how many people we actually moved. I realized that what we transported like 70 or 80 people. Um, I know that I think that everybody who, who left the train um, survived. I had to track down all my patients from that incident because it was, I, I, I went to, to talk to Amanda, I just spoke to her yesterday, I talked to, the, talked to the young man who with a double femur fracture. It wasn't bilateral, it was a, just one leg that was a double femur fracture. And I talked to him as well, he was doing all right. Amanda was, she's very banged up, she, but uh, it's amazing she survived. These responders were absolutely focused on moving ahead. It's not like they didn't know that the metro rail system runs on 750 volts and it'll kill the first person that touches the rail. They absolutely knew that. But they also absolutely know that there was a tremendous amount to risk and there was a tremendous opportunity to save. And, and that's what moved them forward in spite of those risks. The bravery of our folks to operate in those conditions, the ingenuity to know what to do, the training and skill set, the professionalism that was brought to bear was just, just tremendous. We did what we were trained to do, and I think that we did it well, but you cannot walk away from a situation like that and not feel something, not feel a sense of that this is a very tragic thing that happened. But then it sticks with you throughout your career. It was as horrible as any, 
but there are tough sights that a firefighter has to put up with. I, I think when you sign on the line or pin on the badge, whichever analogy, that that's, that's just the next call away when you have to deal with such tremendous suffering, and it's hard to make sense out of it. The fire service cares. I mean, we do. We put the face on, but it's still a, it's a, we do care about what we do, and we want to do a good job. We want to get it, we want to, we want to have people make it home. We pray for all those who have suffered in this terrible tragedy, most especially for those who have died. Lavonda King, Veronica DuBose. I was there in remembrance of what happened. Uh, you know, I'm sympathetic truly because of uh, what happened. Cameron Williams, Ana Fernandez, Janice McMillan. While we're sitting in a prayer service, it just felt like, you know, that it felt good to actually show support for the families. Um, that, that felt kind of good to show support, but um, I got chills. Mary Doolittle, Ann Worley, Major General David F. Worley Jr., Dennis Hawkins.